My name is Mary Lynn Johnson. It is Wednesday, June the 30th. We're here in Atlanta, Georgia at the Atlanta History Center with Mr. Alan Catenhead. Hi, I'm Roy Alton Catenhead Sr. I live in Calhoun, Georgia. My date of birth is June 22nd, 1924, which makes me ancient, really. <laughs> uh, could you uh, tell us uh, where you were born and raised? Yes, I was born in the lower part of Troop County, Georgia, almost what is now Pine Mountain, Georgia at that time, was Chipley, Georgia. Uh, I grew up there. We grew up on a farm. Uh, my father was a sharecropper, and that was the beginning for us. And uh, from there we moved on to where we are in the world today. And what uh what was your education before you went into service? Just high school. Just high school. Mm -hmm. And did you, uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I volunteered for the Marine Corps. And, uh, I was 19 years old uh, and I entered the Marine Corps. And what kind of uh, thoughts did you have leading up to your decision to volunteer? I mean, what made, made you decide to volunteer? Well, it was a thing to do. Everybody who was physically able, I think, felt like that they must join in this because uh, uh, it's hard for people today, youngsters, to understand that uh, conditions were desperate. Uh, you know, Pearl Harbor took out an awful lot that we had. And, we were not equipped, and, and the German submarines were running up and down our coast, sinking ships along the coast. So we knew that sooner or later we were going to have to make a stand. And so I would have been drafted into the Army had I not volunteered for the Marine Corps. Now, why did I join the Marines? Uh, it just looked like an elite outfit. Uh, I had talked with a couple of the Marines and uh, was so amazed at their uh, confidence that was somehow embedded in them and not only that but how they felt about the Marine Corps and what the Marine Corps was scheduled to do uh, in World War II. And so from that, uh, the only other branch that I considered was the Coast Guard. but. After talking with the Marines and seeing maybe the movie Wake Island or something like that, uh, I determined that the Marine Corps was where I was going to be. And what year was this? This is 1943. And it's, <clears throat> yes, uh, there were times when I wondered how foolish I might I, I was. And uh, there were times when I said I wish I had three legs, two to stand on, one to kick myself because <laughs> never been in such a difficult and such a taskful organization in my life, uh, but it all proved out to be worthwhile because they knew physically and mentally what we were going to be faced with, and so they prepared us for it. What do you remember about your first days in service? Well, <clears throat> the first days uh, were frightening, and if you, anyone who has been through Paris Island, South Carolina, would certainly say the same thing, that uh, they literally break down all resistance that you might have. And that's done so that when you receive a command, you don't question that command, you don't think, I've got a better idea, you uh, immediately carry out that command. So that begins the first day. I know, forget, we were sworn in in the Navy building in Atlanta, Georgia, on a Sunday morning, and we were we put aboard a bus and we went to Paris Island, South Carolina. Just had a lot of fun on the bus. This is going to be great. The fellowship was wonderful. I met an awful lot of young, new people. We were all teenagers. And when we got to Paris Island, we pulled into the gate. Some big sergeant got on the bus, didn't say a word to anyone, walked to the back of the bus and screamed. You could have heard him four miles get out of this bus and from that day on we were running and when we came it was raining and when we came out of the bus somebody threw something at us almost like a pouch 
we had no other idea what we had. It was a poncho. Instead of telling us what to do with that poncho, uh, they just allowed us to get soaking wet. And so I spent 12 weeks there. And I don't think I walked a minute the, the time I was there. But the two things the Marine Corps tries to instill, or three things really, one is organization. Uh, you become a part of an organizational unit. And that has its, has its drawbacks also. But the second thing is the physical ability that they create within you. Just for an example, when I went in the Marine Corps, I weighed 178 pounds and I had exercised myself. I was in good physical condition. But after 12 weeks at Paris Island, I weighed 148 pounds. The clothes they issued me, the sleeves came down below my fingers, and the, I, I mean, I was really ashamed of how I looked when I, on my 10 day furlough when I went home after boot camp. That's the second thing they do, but the third thing they create within you is the mental ability to control yourself and not ever let fear become dominant in your life because when you're fearful you you make foolish moves and so they they equip you with that and they do an excellent job you, you do realize didn't realize it when you're going through it but they did an excellent job in, in preparing you for what might be out there so when you when you finished boot camp what rank were you I was a private. A private. And what, at the war's end, what was your rank? I was a corporal. In fact, I had passed my sergeant's exam and been issued sergeant stripes, and I still have them. Uh, but in the Marine Corps, it's, and naturally you expect me to say that it's different from other organizations, in the Marine Corps you're only allowed so many lieutenants, so many colonels, so many majors, and you can be in the Marine Corps 30 years and never make, get a promotion if something didn't open up. They just did not promote you because you were promotable. And for instance, uh, when you go into combat and you have officers and those ahead of you that are knocked out, then you move up. For instance, I was a corporal, but I was running a squad. But as soon as the campaign was over, I went back to where I was. There was no, I was a platoon sergeant acting. But when the campaign was over, I went back to corporal because you have to earn those stripes. They just don't issue them uh, just for the convenience. When I went to Camp Lejeune, when I finished my training at Camp Lejeune, I became a PFC. And I went overseas, and my first campaign at Guam, uh, I was a PFC. And then during that time at Guam before he was in on a corporal. Okay, well going back to boot camp, do you remember any of your instructors specifically? Yes, I started to bring you a, a letter, and let me say this up front, uh, my wife and I married right out of high school. We were 18 years old. Uh, you say that's foolish. Yes, <laughs> yes, but it worked out beautifully. We'll celebrate our 62nd wedding anniversary, 25th of September. Uh, but I, contrary to a lot of drill instructors and people who look at you in your boot camp, I had this Corporal Mitchell that was just a very decent human being. And yes, he was very strict, very rough, but he was also fair. He also recognized the fact that you were a human being. And see, you're not considered a Marine Corps when you're in boot camp. You're not issued a, you're a recruit. You're not issued an emblem. You're not issued anything to indicate you're a Marine. Uh, when you graduate from boot camp, you become a Marine. You're issued that globe and anchor emblem, uh, and you're given everything. And when you go into the Camp Lejeune, this advanced training, it's a total different world. You are a Marine. But this fellow, Mitchell, was just such a humanitarian, you might say. He was a school teacher prior to the war, before he came into the service. And he came to Guam. Guam, when we took Guam, Guam became the home base of the 3rd Marine Division. And he came to Guam after Iwo. 
and he came looking for some of us that were in boot camp with him. And uh, it was just a joy to meet him. Well, he was only there about three months, and they sent him back to the States to uh, the officer's training school. That's how intelligent he was. And he wrote my wife a beautiful letter when he got back to the States, and she had it now in her scrapbook. And if I'd have just thought about it, I would have brought it along. It, it would tell you a little bit about they are human beings in the Marine Corps, not just John Wayne type, you know, people. But he was a good leader, and he gave a, a good expression, and he told her how, how well I looked, and uh, that I had, she knew how much weight I had lost in boot camp, and he told her that I had gained weight back, and that I looked great, and I uh, was in the attitude was great, and was going through the advanced training there on Guam again. But, uh, Did he do this for every soldier or every no, Marine? No, I, I don't know. I, I kind of doubt it, because the way he and I became really attached is we were both Baptists in, in, uh, in the world, and uh, when I would go to services, he was always there, and he saw me there, and I think that attachment was a reason we became kind of attached. And I didn't ask for any favors, didn't, and he didn't offer any, but uh, he came to visit with me when he, he got his uh, word that he was going to go back to officer's training school. And I said, well, that's just great. Please keep us posted on, uh, on, on how you're making out. And uh, he said, what's your family's address? And so I gave him my wife's address, and, uh, and he wrote a lot of beautiful love. But, and I, I've always been, I just thought, that's just wonderful. He didn't have to do that. But uh, he, uh, he really expressed it. And he told I, that I had made it through Iwo Jima fairly well, uh, and he hoped that we would never have to experience a battle like that again. Uh, but whatever is out there, we would be equipped for it, and you don't have to worry about him not being equipped for what was out there. So it was a beautiful love. I didn't mean to get him. Oh, that. that's fine. It was. It I'm glad you shared that. No, that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, can you give me sort of the an outline or just whatever you want to tell us about your days following boot camp and and how you, you know, leading up to your first engagement? Well. <clears throat> You, when you leave Paris Island, you get a 10-day furlough. And they caution you, because we were at war. Things were not going great for us. And they caution you to not make any uh, permanent arrangements. In other words, don't get married while you're on, on your 10-day leave, because you are bound for combat and things could go against you. And so we took that 10-day leave, and I was already married and was trying to spend some time. I spent all the time with my wife and, and with my parents and with my brothers, like Paul and my family. We grew up as a unit, and uh, there was an awful lot of love for one another because we were very poor. As my second brother, he, he says we grew up below the water level, which means that we were in poverty. But uh, we were very close, and so I spent time with them. And then when it came time to leave, now I'm not trying to be emotional. I remembered what we were told. And I said goodbye. That may be the last time I will see them. So <clears throat> you leave that. And when I walked, Paul was in Atlanta with me. And and when we walked away that day, that night, I realized, I mean, it was see him again. And was he already in the service no, at this point? No, And so uh, I went back to camp, went to Camp Lejeune, and it was the most miserable days I've ever spent in my life. Because I realized, and please excuse this, but I realized how much love there was uh, within my family and my wife, so we were just teenagers, how much I loved them, and how much she loved me, and I thought, I'm sacrificing all of this. 
That doesn't make sense, does it? I'm sacrificing all of this. I don't they may never see them again. And so it was miserable for a few days, but the Marines in charge at, at Camp Lejeune realized what you were going through. And they worked you day and night. You didn't have time. I mean, we had to learn things that I'd never heard of before. Uh, uh, asthmas for traveling and how you conduct yourself when you were in, uh, in combat and go through all experiences of uh, gas chambers or uh, anything that, that, that you could keep your mind on what you were doing and, and advance your training. And so they, they tried to make a break. And after the second week at Camp Lejeune, it all began to come together. And you made new friends, not the friends you had in Paris Island, but you made new friends. And, uh, my bunkmate was a young fellow named Roland Byron from uh, uh, Athol, Massachusetts, who turned out to be the best friend I had in the Marine Corps. And we would uh, catch a bus, go into Wilmington, and get a hamburger, and catch a bus back. We had to be back by, by 11 o'clock. And so, but at uh, Camp Lejeune, you became a Marine because you were given an emblem. You could proudly wear it on your cap and all of that. So, it was a little different world. And where did you go after Camp Lejeune? After Camp Lejeune, we. Uh, <clears throat> Quick story. Okay, please. My wife came up to spend the weekend with me at Camp Lejeune. And she had gone, had gotten a room through uh, the USO, had provided a room for us. And, and we had gone to a little restaurant on Saturday night, Saturday afternoon late. And the chiefs were running up and down the street, loudspeaker, such and such a unit returned to your base immediately. It was mine. I said, I didn't hear them, you know. So about 3 o'clock in the morning, I decided, you know, I better, better work my way back to camp. Something's going on. And so I caught the Marine Corps bus that runs every hour back to Camp Lejeune. And when I got to my, we were in Quonset huts, which is just a small oval hut that held only a squad. Everybody was gone. My sea bag was gone. Where on earth is everybody? And so I ran into a fellow on guard duty and I said, Where is such and such a unit? Which is mine. He said, You're on the parade field. What am I doing on the parade field at four o'clock in the morning? So I took off to the parade field and saw Roland Byron. He said, Where in the world have you been? I said, I've been in camp, I've been in Wilmington, but did you get the word to report in? No, I didn't get it. Fibbing you. He said, I've got your sea bag here. So we loaded a board train, went to uh, San Diego, California, and we were only there a week and we went aboard ship, headed overseas. So that was my short stay in the United States. And after you left San Diego, where did you go? We went to Anahuita. And we thought had already been taken, and there we uh, joined the the third division, and we knew we were not told until then aboard ship that we were headed for the Isle of Guam. You know, we lost uh, we lost Guam early on in the war because the Japanese wanted to take total control of the Pacific Ocean, and they had to to do that. They had to totally take all the land mass on the rim of the ocean, all the islands and so on. We lost the Philippines, we lost Guam, and uh, that was in 1942. And of course the movement back northward did not start until 1942, late 42. Uh, the next move after the Solomon Islands, of course, was Australia and, uh, and New Zealand. And had that happened, we wouldn't have had a base of operation anywhere in the Pacific. And the whole goal of the Japanese was for us then to seek peace based on their terms, which would have been miserable. And so the decision was made that the line had to be drawn in the sand. At that time, 
General MacArthur and his army were total in preparation to someday going back to the Philippines, because that's a promise that he had made. So little to stop in the Japanese was handed to Edmund Emmons. And he made the decision and created the role for the Marine Corps in World War II. He said the Marine Corps is an amphibious unit. The units are small, but they're very efficient. They must become a factor in stopping the Japanese and changing the course of history. And so in late 1942, the 1st Marine Division landed on Water Canal, which was a very difficult task. Uh, they had to be abandoned by the Navy because of the overwhelming naval force that the Japanese had, but they, were, they prevailed. And from, the Guad from Guadalcanal, then, we would start northward. And every island, every landmass had to be taken. And every one of them would become stepping stones toward the uh, Japanese Empire. So you were 3rd Marines? 3rd Marines. We landed. Our first entanglement was uh, at Bougainville. And what year was that? That was in 1943, early 43, but it was already over by the time we got there. But uh, then Bougainville became your home base until we landed at Guam, and Guam then became our home base with the 3rd Marine Division. And from Guam we went to Iwo Jima. So uh, what kind of combat did you see? I was in Guam, on the island of Guam, and then in the island of Iwo Jima. Okay. Can you describe um, what you experienced at Guam? Well, <clears throat> Guam was a very beautiful island. As I say, it belonged to us prior to 1942 when it fell to the Japanese. It was a beautiful island. The uh, island was covered with uh, coconut groves, uh, pineapple orchards, banana farms, uh, just a very gorgeous island. And I didn't see it except in rubble. But uh, they say that the cities on Guam were, were uh, Ghana, for instance, was the most beautiful city in the Central Pacific. But we destroyed it. The only thing left standing was the front of the Catholic Church. But the streets were little narrow streets, brick paved, and it was a beautiful thing. And then we got into the island, and uh, it was a it was a campaign that could go according to the book. In other words, you were organized to do certain things. I was a BAR man, which is a Brown and Automatic Rifle. And if you come in contact with the enemy, and you couldn't move them, then you could circumvent the enemy, or you could make another landing and come in behind the enemy. And, uh, and that's what the book trains you, the way the book trains you. And that could take place on Guam. Uh, the casualties were there, yes, uh, but you only had some, some 2,300 dead on the big island of Guam, which is a huge island. We drove the Japanese into what we call the boondock areas, about a five square mile area of nothing but just we would call them swamps in this country. And we backed the Japanese into that and we decided let's just circle it and not try to move them out, starve them out. That worked to a degree but it didn't work totally. And uh, one little bit of, we were moving into that area early one morning and my company was on the right flank of the movement and heard the most beautiful whistling I ever heard in my life. And immediately, my uh, company commander said, it's a trap, it's a trap, be careful, we're going to move slow. And so he finally continued on, he finally said for my squad to uh, see if you can encircle this and see what might be happening there. And so when we found it, there was a little boy, didn't look a day over seven years of age, up in the top of one of those coconut trees, chopping out the cabbage that was up there, and they, that was a, a food for them. And he was up there with a machete, chopping away at that, whistling, I don't want to set the world on fire, I just want to start a flame in your heart. That was popular back in those days, and I'm sure that he had picked it up, because the Marine base was at Guam prior to the war. And he had picked it up, but it was just such a beautiful tune for the, and he didn't know, he, he, he didn't care whether the war was a thousand miles or one mile away. He was just up there preparing food, getting food for his family. 
And we got back and told our company commander our story. And he just grinned and said, let's move. And so we moved out. But Guam became our base. And as I say, it was a very beautiful island. Today, every, every motel chain of any size has a, has a hotel there. And it is now the vacation land for the Japanese, the Chinese, and an awful lot of Americans. And I hope someday to take my wife there to see that island because it was such a beautiful island. Uh, and it was big, the Air Force, the B-29s were there, the, the uh, Bomber Force. The Navy had tremendous resources there, and the whole 3rd Marine Division was there. And the Marines were in the back part of the island because you were constantly in training. And you were training for some detail that was to come in days ahead. Did they give you any ideas about uh, what your next engagement would be or where we would be going? No, when we look back, excuse me, when we look back on it now, uh, you might... Am I talking too long? No, I was just checking the time. <laughs> uh, you look back on it now, you can see that they had an idea of what was happening, but we did not know until we were two days at sea. We went aboard the ship at, uh, at, at Guam, and we would see the second day they told us what our objective was. And the Marine Corps, you expect me to say this, but they do everything right as well as they can. And up on the top of the island, up on the top deck of the ship, rather, there was a replica of the island that we were going to take. And every morning, we had to go up and go to school. And that was all the intelligence they had. It was to be a three-day operation. And so we would go to school, and then physical condition, yes, had to take. Had to. And then we were given, in the afternoon aboard the ship, we were given two or three hours to read. They had a library on the ship. We could go check out a book to read. Uh, but that's the only time that we knew. And that, right or so, that's the way it should be. And what uh, island were they talking about? Iwo Jima. Jima. And it was to be, <clears throat> it was to be a three-day operation. Let me show you. Yeah, let me focus in on that. Okay. This. Okay. This was to be the end of the first day. Mm -hmm. They even told us where we were supposed to be at the end of the first hour. I mean, they were so organized. We would be such and such a place at the end of the first hour. The end of the first day, they, these maps they gave us, they, everybody had a map. This is where you were to be at the end of the first day. This is where you were to be at the end of the second day. And you mop up the end of the third day. But it took 33 days. And you said your job was, you were a BAR man. Right. Tell me a little bit about what that meant. Well, it's, a, it's an automatic weapon that uh, has a magazine that holds 21 rounds. And you, the squad is divided into five teams. There are three, four men, five teams, they call them five teams, in each of the squads. And in that squad, you have two M1, in that fire team, you have two M1 rifles, and you have one brown automatic, and one carbine. That's the firepower that you have. And then you see there's three of those in each of those squads. And a squad is about 12? The squad is, is little to 13 men, okay. because you've got a squad leader okay. here. Okay. And in your organization, when you, when you land, you ought to do this. Your unit goes here, this unit goes there, and you, you're totally organized as to what you are to do and where you are to go. But the problem disintegrated, I mean the organization disintegrated early because there were so, such limited beaches. I've got a map here, let me show you. I don't want to, I don't want to drag this out. Oh, you I'll me. keep time. We'll keep an eye on the time. So. You just tell me when to shut up. Okay. <laughs> We've got about 15 or 20 more minutes left. Huh? About 15 more minutes. Okay, very quickly so. we'll go through this. So. This is a map that's uh, a And one of the 
things that was to our disadvantage was, was the fact that you were so limited, the only place you could land on the island was right here, from here to here. And because of that, the enemy knew that. And so what they would do, they would say, okay, we'll focus all our firepower into this area, which totally broke down our organization because the first man in my platoon to get hit when we landed was my platoon commander, the second lieutenant. And so then immediately a sergeant moved up to take his place, and he didn't last a day and a half. And so that's why the organization began to break down, and, and the Marine Corps recognized this. And when we went back to Guam and started training again for, we had something totally new, which was village warfare, houses in front, the CBs had built. They put in contingency plans, in other words, we've got, we've got a 12-man squad, if the squad leader gets off, you take his place. And then you're the number two man to take the place. But we did not have that organization continues to plans here. And so as a result, the organization was, was, you almost became a separate entity, which is not good in, in any campaign. This is the beach. We didn't know that was what that was. This is, this is the beach sand. It's very difficult. You can't walk in it. You can't dig a foxhole in it. Uh, mechanical equipment cannot maneuver on it. And so that was against us. The intelligence was very slim, but even in our schooling aboard ship, that was not given to us because they didn't know. The other thing they didn't know that this thing was just, every one of these red marks represents a gun emplacement, a fortification. And they did not know all of this, the intelligence didn't, but these fortifications were connected by tunnels, miles of tunnels underground. And so it's, uh, it was, it was just terrible for a few days. And the terrain was such that you had a very difficult time trying to hide, and trying to, trying to conceal yourself when you were approaching the enemy. Well, tell me what was, what was it like for you? I mean, what, were, what did you feel when you were in these situations and how did you cope? And, you know, I know you did your job, obviously. The two things that Two things you have to be very mindful of. Number one is fatigue. It's a major factor. Number two is fear. You've got, you've got to control these two. For instance, when you say, how do you control fatigue? If you get a minute, you got three minutes. Sleep three minutes. Because if you allow fear to take over, you make foolish moves. I only saw one man I felt like that on Evo that lost it. He came down the beach screaming and hollering and, and I just thought, boy, you know, he didn't control fear. It got him. And if you can do that and you can exercise judgment, it doesn't work all the time because the enemy is doing the same thing. Who outsmarts who? But uh, the you, you know there are times when you know you're not going to make it. There's no way I can make it through this. Uh, as I was telling a group in school not long ago, the, you pray every night. You thank the Lord that you made it through another day. But as far as my day, then I pray for my people back home. Uh, and you knew the men that had lost, you had lost that day, and you prayed for their people because they'd soon be getting a telegram. And then life would never be the same for them again. You're constantly mindful of the fact that you may not make it. You may not make it. One of the things that, <clears throat> that we do, uh, that the Marine Corps did, was before we, uh, before we landed, the night before we landed on Iwo, it was not that way on Guam, but the night before we landed on Iwo, our battalion commander asked everyone else to write a letter to someone back home, as if we were not going to make it. 
and if you don't make it, the chaplain will mail you a letter to your family, and they will get you a letter before they get the telegram from the, from the, from the, from the Marine Corps. And this will prepare them better because, and you say, what do you say in a letter? What does a 19-year-old boy say in a letter like that? You simply say, I know where I'm headed. I don't know the outcome. And I may not make it. And I had to say to my wife, uh, you're still young. We had a happy short time together. But life must go on. And you go on and just remember that I loved you, but I can't be there anymore. And you move on and make a good life for yourself. You give that letter to the chaplain. If you make it, he gives it back to you. If he didn't, then he mailed it to the people back home. And you say, is that necessary? I thought it was, after I became an adult, and I thought it was very wise. They were thinking ahead that your letter would prepare them for what was they were to get. And they did not know that you did not make it until they got the telegram, but then in the te then your letter, they go back and read your letter and they, it was just, I could foresee that I'm not going to make it. And so, it was difficult. It was difficult. Uh, I've never been through anything like that. Uh, and 6,800 Marines died on that island. Another 26,000 was wounded. And if you put the mass to that, you'll see that a thousand Marines fell from the ranks every day. Now, what if that happened today in Iraq or somewhere else? But a thousand Marines fell, and then literally thousands of them, including me, who were injured, we continued to fight. I was hit the first time. We had just finished taking the second half strip, or was in the midst of taking the second half strip, which was in the middle of that island here. As you can see. This is the second air strip right here. And we were taking the second air strip, and I felt a terrible pain in this arm and hand. I looked and blood was running off of my hand. The corpsman <clears throat> cut away my sleeve, and my arm and the scars are still down there. It was peppered with, with shrapnel. Can, can we show that, show that again? You said I'm sorry, what? Oh, did your arm. Oh, yeah. See, the scars. It runs all the way up this arm and into this, this thing. He cut away the sleeve and he saw it had been peppered with shrapnel and he did all he could. He bandaged it tightly and asked me if I could continue on. And I said, it's my left hand. Yes, I can. We had just finished the, the second air strip and we thought everything behind us was clean. Bear in mind that our ranks at that point had been cut in half. And so we were moving out from the second air strip, and all of a sudden, machine gun opened up from behind us. And yes, casualties were there. And my platoon commander at that time was a buck sergeant. And he said, Kate Ned, you and Byron, work your way back to that machine gun. Silence it. If it's a cave, blow it. Roland Byron was my friend. We'd been friends. He was a Catholic. I'd been to his services. He had been to my services. And so we worked our way back and we saw that the machine gun was coming from a cave. And he says, Al, you find that cave as fast as you can. I'll get as close as I can and I'll toss in the satchel charge. The satchel charge was like the old book satchel we used to have that had the composition C2 stacked in it almost like margarine butter. He worked his way up and he threw it in. Well, it hit a rubber band and he came right back out. And we could not escape the path. When I came to, I was covered with dirt. I was bleeding at my nose and ears. And the Coleman was working with me. And I asked about Byron. He said, Byron's dead. Uh, we'd been partners. We knew what to do. 
we knew each one of us knew what the other one was going to do. And you see the importance of that, but then when you get a new one, it, it's, it's quite different. But he said, I'm going to clean your wounds, I'm going to pack your head in oil, and I'll change it daily. Do you think you can continue? And I said, let's give it a chance. And of course, when we got back to Guam, I had to go through a debriefing and go through the hospital for checking wounds. And he, the, the doctor, the Navy doctor was examining my, he said, uh, Corporal, you need to be grateful to that corn because he saved your hearing. And I, I still wear an amplifier in this, in this ear. He said you would have lost your hearing on both ears had he not done what he did. Because all the insulation, everything was busted away. Um, How did you cope with, with uh, losing your, your best friend? You cry a little bit. He had a wife. I knew her. I had met her. And I knew it wasn't going to be easy for her. But <clears throat> the very next day, we were to take a ridge, which would be the left flank of the 4th Division. The 3rd Division went up the center of the island. The 5th was on the left, 4th was on the right. We were to take a ridge which came out from the, the 4th Division, was holding them up. And so we fought our way up to the top of that ridge all day with bayonets and flamethrowers and so on. When we got to the top of the ridge, we knew we couldn't hold it. We didn't have the manpower. And so it soon became very well known that we were going to have to retreat. So we had to make a hasty retreat because they were after us with machine guns. And even leaving our dead. That night, late that afternoon, replacements came up. Now where do replacements come from? It comes from a pool back here. They could have been cooks, they could have been stretcher bearers or whatever they might be. And a 17-year-old Marine was assigned to my unit that night. I found, learned only his first name and that he had been in the Marine Corps for eight months. The next morning we were to move out at daybreak and take that same ridge again only to be caught in a machine gun crossfire. I told my young friends, stay down, stay down until we can find the source of the fire. And he said, I can't see if I stay down. I said, well that doesn't matter, just stay down. We'll look for you. I was an old 19 year old. I knew all about it. but. In just a few moments, he says, I've been hit in my right side. I called a corpsman, and just as the corpsman reached us, he was killed. In just a few moments, my young friend started calling his mother. And he did until he died. And by the time we got the machine gun this silenced, my young friend was dead. <clears throat> At age 17, his life was cut short. And <clears throat> I've thought about it since then. You remember when you used to skin your fingers, bump your knees, you go to mama. I'm gonna try to get through this, okay. <clears throat> He'd go to mother and she would kiss it and what happened? It was all well. And my young friend died thinking if my mama could just get here, everything would be okay. <clears throat> we took the ridge, yes. Again, we lost people. And then we moved on the upper part of this island. You can't, it's hard to explain the terrain. It was cliffs and canyons and caves and what we had done, we had compressed the enemy into this area and we knew he was going to be more diligent and more determined. And so every inch of these cliffs, every inch of these caverns and canyons had to be taken because they were filled with emplacements, they were filled with canyons. And we worked our way and one night a screaming 
bonsai attack, I saw this image coming toward my foxhole. And by the time I brought him down, his hand fell over the rim of my foxhole, still grasping his knife. The next morning at daylight hours, his helmet was off. And in that helmet was a picture of a soldier, a lady, and a child. And I know that was his family. But he was determined he was going to give his life to destroy Marines. Bonsai's were destructive, yes, they would kill Marines, but the rest of us would get no rest, and the next day fatigue became a real factor. But we fought our way through these canyons, and we reached the peak one afternoon up over at the end of the island, and when we looked over that peak, we saw the ocean. And up in this area, because of the rain, the only tools you had was grenades, bayonets, flamethrowers. And the VAR almost had to replace the machine gun because the machine guns couldn't, couldn't maneuver in this area. But we looked over the ridge and there was the ocean. And you can't imagine how elated you were, this thing's about over. And it is a legend and a tradition in the Marine Corps, when you reach the ocean, the end of an island, you get a canteen of ocean water and you send it back to headquarters. And that's how it got started, but that's the tradition. Twenty of us went down that cliff into the ocean to get a canteen of water. I didn't go as far as some because my arm was still in a big bandage. And just as we were getting the canteen of water, the machine gun opened up on us from the base of the cliff, and six men fell immediately. And by the time we silenced that machine gun, there's two of those men that washed out to sea and could not be retrieved. That was a good stopping point to switch the tape over. I'm taking too long. You well, we've got a few more minutes. This tape doesn't last as long as that one. Okay, so we are at the ocean at yeah. Iwo Jima. And so <clears throat> we could not retrieve those men. The other four, yes, they could be retrieved. But six of them fell, and we, we had to wipe out that machine gun nest. The last thing that's done on an island before the Marine Corps leaves it, we never, we never control an item by them. We, we have an amphibious force. We take them, turn over to somebody else. The last thing that you do is dedicate the cemetery. That's the most, most emotional experience you can ever have. You go through the cemetery and you find the crosses of the men you trained with, you lived with, you argued with, yes. You shared your life's dreams with them, what your life's plans were. They shared theirs with you. And now you're about to leave them and you'd never see them on this earth again. You say, can that be emotional? It is very emotional even to an old, ugly Marine. And you think about, when we got back to Guam, I wrote letters to my friends who died. And the ones who, they would write you back and they all had the same question, did you suffer? And you always had to say, no, it was instant death, even though you knew in some cases it was not. But it was, that, that is a very emotional thing. We lost all of those Marines, some 26,000 wounded life for them, but that would be the same again because arms were lost, legs were lost. And you ask the question, was it really worth it? And the reason it was taken was because here at the Guam, Mariana Islands, and the B-29 were bombing the Japanese mainland. Because of the distance, it could be fighter protection for them, fighter planes. 
so many of them were being so damaged that they couldn't make it back the 1,400 miles to Guam and, and uh, Saipan and Tinian, and they were being lost at sea, plane and crew. And that's when the island of Iwo Jima came in. It was halfway between the Mariana Islands and the Japanese mainland. We would take it and it would become a hospital island, a hospital island for crippled 29ers. <clears throat> the first crippled 29s that landed on Iwo Jima were landed in March with a fighting just a short distance away. And the name of that plane was, was a dynamite. This Marine Corps sent me a picture of it. And from that day, and, and I'll, I think I brought that publication with me, from that day until the end of the war, the 2400 crippled 29 B-29 would land at the Iwo Jima for the crew of, that's the picture of the first of the Marine Corps Center. For the crew, 27,000 airmen were involved in these 2,400 B-29s. And you say, we lost the 6,800 Marines dead, another 26,000 wounded. And so you have to say that in so doing, we saved 27,000 airmen from a watery grave. And I was watching the History Channel not long ago, but it's been just recently. And this old gray-headed man uh, was on the History Channel. He says, I never see a Marine that I don't tip my hat because I had to land on Iwo, on Iwo Jima. I couldn't make it back to the Marianas and I would have been lost. That was the sole purpose of this, this campaign. We landed after we went aboard ship. We went back to Guam, and we started training again for our next, uh, for our next assignment. And I have a uh, picture here that, and I'll let you read it. The letter okay. the commandant sent me, the Marine Corps. Dear Corporal Cadenhead, I wanted to take a moment to personally thank you for your dedicated service to our precious Corps. Few have seen more of war's reality than you. In Guam and in the epic battle for Iwo Jima, you distinguished yourself time and again. On the battlefields of the Pacific and later as a, as a citizen after the war, our nation is better for your selfless service. I want you to know that I and our entire Corps of Marines are proud of all you have become. You have lived your life by our core values of honor, courage, and commitment, always a shining example for others to emulate. As they say, once a Marine, always a Marine. You are living proof. Sa uh, Semper Fidelis, signed C.C. What? How do you say his last name? <laughs> Kabulak. Yeah, no, it's K R U L A K. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And he sent me an autographed picture wow. along with it. And when is that letter dated? Uh, dated, uh, it was on my 75th birthday. Okay. That's terrific. 26, 1999. 1999. And then this, this is the picture of the 19-year-old Marine. Is that uh, after you finished boot camp? That's after the boot yeah, camp. Yeah, because you're wearing the... Yeah, wearing the... <laughs> I was at Camp of June when this was made. Well, when you left Iwo Jima, you went back to Guam, Guam. and w and you continued training. Well, what there. had what had happened? Uh, this, the CBs, you're familiar with that, the yes, construction sir. battalion of the Navy, had gone back into what we call the boondocks, and had built streets, storefronts, housing fronts, and so on, which was total new training for us. And so we we started training about how we would get into a building. We had never been able to, never had this training to protect one while he went into another building, you go in another building, he'd protect you and all of this. How to throw grenades into windows and uh, how to throw ropes over and climb over a building. Uh, we went back through training and the CBs had built that for us. And then we saw the contingency program that we hadn't had before is that here's 12 men, 13 men, when this one gets knocked off, you become the commander. When he gets knocked, you become. So we had that 
sequence worked out so that we wouldn't have the same breakdown in organization again that we had on Iwo Jima. And I got a, a letter, another letter from, from the Commandant at that time, and I tried to find it, and he told, showed me where my unit was to land on the Japanese mainland and what day, it was in November the 26th or something like that, in 1945 that we were to land on the mainland of Japan. Uh, but we came in from training one afternoon, exhausted. And immediately I went, there was six men in my tent. I went to my bunk and I just fell asleep. And one of my tent mates came running down, Caden Head, Caden Head, get up, get up. We got a bum that's stronger than a train load of TNT. And I said, Ed, you've been in the Raisin Jack this early? He said, oh, come on, come on, come to the, to the uh, radio tent. So we went, I went up, wrapped a towel around and went up to the radio tent and it was squalling and screaming. You could, I couldn't make out sense out of it. But our company commander came to the edge of the tent and said, boys, it may be over. So this was August 6, 1945. And I, I sat down on a coconut log and cried. And my friend said, Kid, why in the world are you crying? I said, I'm going home. But that's how, I, and I never picked up another rifle mm -hmm. after that day. Never picked. The third division was disbanded immediately. Uh, and I still had two months to serve over there. And so we all had to take a series of examinations and as a result of, I guess of that examination I was placed in, uh, in engineering. And what I spent the last two months was designing sewage treatment plants and water treatment plants and streets because they were going to establish Marine Corps headquarters there again. And then the time came for me to come home. Again let me say and you expect me to say this, but the Marine Corps tries to cover all bases. I did not know this for 10 years after I'd been home, <clears throat> but the Marine Corps wrote my wife a letter, and she still has it, and told her that I had been trained for violence, that I had, been, had participated in violence, and that I was going to need help repatriating myself to American society. And we have to depend upon the home, the church, and the community. And do your best to make his transition as easy as possible. And I know when I came out it wasn't easy. If someone did something I didn't like, I thought I was supposed to take charge, you know, I was supposed to handle it. But my wife was so patient, so patient, and I'll ever be indebted to the church. But immediately she put me right in the middle of the church and kept me busy. And uh, then I had to, you know, go to school and try to get some preparation made for life. But the Marine Corps, I'll always be grateful for the fact that they look after you. After it's all, they just don't dump you out. But she showed me the letter after I'd been on 10 years. And my, my parents knew about it. Everybody knew about it but me. But it, it worked out. Well, when you got home, uh, you said you went, went to school. And what did you grow up to be? I had to change my <laughs> desires. I wanted to, all my life to be a civil engineer. On the, the creek ran back of our place where we grew up. There was an old Confederate dam, partly eroded, partly most of it was gone. But I was going to become a civil engineer. I was going to dam up the creek, and I was going to put in a generator. And I was going to sell electricity to all those people down there. They didn't have it then. And, but of course, REA came through in 1936 and wiped out uh, all of that dream. So I came back and. I'll always be indebted to an organization called Callaway Mills, who was in the Green Story. They came to see me and uh, wanted me to go to Texas school. Mr. Callaway went to 
Texas A&M, he went to Clemson, he went to Auburn, he went to Tech, and tried to get them to create a Texas school. There was no Texas school. The only one there was a Philadelphia, <coughs> was Philadelphia Textiles. And they knew that the student body would be a small wapu with it. So he built his own textile school and uh, hired one of the assistants at Philadelphia Textile School to come and run his school. So they said, we'll give you a job and you go to school and we'll go as far with you as you want to go. And so I did. And then when I finished that, you, uh, you're not familiar with ITT at Charlottesville, North Carolina, but that's the uh, uh, Institute of Textile Technology. And they sent me to ITT. And so I kind of, instead of becoming, and I majored in mechanical and structural. Instead of becoming a civil engineer, I became something else. And I wrote Senator George, who was our senator at that time, told him what an offer I had been made. I didn't have any children, but would it be possible that I could transfer my benefits to a child of mine? He wrote, I still have a lot, he wrote me back and said, well, uh, if, if it's possible, we'll do our best to get that bill passed, but it never did. And so, but anyway, textiles has been my life, and uh, I'm still a consultant, still working today as a consultant for textiles. In fact, I'm on my way to Pittsburgh, Georgia right now. But, uh, well, thank you so much for sharing your well, story with us. I didn't know what you wanted. Oh, this is exactly what we wanted. And if if you have any, you know, parting thoughts or closing comments that you want to say to sort of sum it all up, I, you know, please. The, please the do. only thing, and I I speak quite often at schools, history classes. I'm just telling Ms. Westbrook I just finished writing an article for Kennesaw College on uh, they're building a monument for this particular island, the Marines who served in the island. And they, only read from, they call the Marine Corps in Washington, and the Marine Corps in Washington referred them to the Marine Corps in Rome, Georgia. Rome, Georgia gave them my name and phone number. And so I, I met with them and listened to what they wanted to do. And I said, I'll be happy to write you a detail, as detailed as I can, uh, of what it was all about. But I speak to student classes, and the thing that bothers me now is that the new generation does not want to hear about it. They don't know how serious it was, and how I met with, spoke to the historical society in Carnival last November. And I started off at how many of you had sauerkraut for breakfast this morning? How many of you had rice for breakfast this morning? Because they thought it was funny. I said, what if English language was not the language of the land? What if this idea of, uh, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness no longer prevailed? And I said, you can't imagine that's how serious it was. That's what would had to take place. That's why we had to do what we did. I reminded them in January 1st, 1942, uh, the Rose Bowl game was transferred from, from Pasadena to Duke University because they were fearful of the Japanese firing missiles into the crowd. Is that true, they say? I said, yes, it's true. And the thing that bothers me is that you don't want you don't want anybody to express appreciation, but you want them to realize that it could have happened. I just finished reading a book that a friend gave me to read. Was it's entitled Five Days in London, May of 1940. And there's a lot of historical events, a lot of historical conversations that took place, a lot of people involved. That was before we entered into the conflict, but. We were on the periphery of, periphery of it. But the end of the book was saying, what if Hitler had conquered Russia? What if Hitler had landed on the shores of England? 
what if D-Day had failed? And what if Hitler had been successful in his pursuit for atomic, en atomic energy? And people want to hear that today. But subs could have fired, German subs could have fired atomic missiles into New York, to Washington, so on. It's that serious. History does not teach that. Classroom work does not handle that. And I guess it's us old folks who have to come in and, and try to tell the bad news, the story. And hopefully someday, <laughs> history, but we'll, I'm 80 years of age, we'll soon be gone. We don't have that many years left and there won't be anybody to tell the story. And I just, I just hope somewhere along the line, this is a great country, uh, it's worth saving. It's the shining light on the hill, as, as President Reagan said. And the rest of the world would like to be here. And I just wish that we would, we, we realize that and could appreciate it. I didn't mean to get it Thank you. That. Now, I think you're right, though. I look at my nieces or my niece and nephews who are all, you know, late teens, early 20s. I've got one 10-year-old nephew. And I think they're just clueless as to what this really meant and what people like you and their grandparents and great-uncles really, really did and, and what what could have happened, you know, if y'all hadn't. So, I know I'm grateful. Well... You compare this country with France, 